Hi everyone. Um, we're just giving everybody a couple more minutes um, to to come online, so we'll get started um, as soon as we have a few more people. Hey, Steph, should we get started? Hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie. I'm the history specialist. Oh, sorry, there goes my dog. This is what happens when we're all working from home. Um, I am the history specialist at Explorica. Um, we just wanted to welcome you all to our webinar about the Italian campaign from Sicily to Ortona. Um, <laughs> Um, we're going to have Dave Robinson presenting for us tonight. He's going to give us a little bit of a history lesson um, about the Italian campaign. Uh, Dave is a retired award-winning social studies teacher uh, from Durham. And then later on in the presentation, we're going to have Aaron Stokes, um, who is one of our well-traveled group leaders who travels with a lot of students on history tours overseas, um, whose grandfather actually uh, fought in Ortona, uh, talk about how she makes a personal connection with the students um, when they go on these trips overseas, especially to Italy, uh, given that her grandfather was part of the Calgary Chinks. Um, so I will um, mute myself so you don't have to hear my dog anymore. And Dave, take it away. Okay, thanks. Uh, could we go to the first slide, Steph, please? This uh, is a, the iconic picture of the Battle of Ortona with the tanks going through the town. And this is actually very realistic on how it uh, looks at. I guess one of the first things you have to do uh, when talking about the Italian campaign, and tonight I'm going to go through it. We're just going to do the first, that's why it's called part one. We're only going to go as far as Ortona because there's just so much to cover. And part of that problem is is that it's usually known as, as the forgotten campaign. Nobody talked. Uh, about the Italian campaign. It's never received the uh, the study, the history, um, or the popularity that, that people have with about D-Day. There's no movies uh, made about the Italian campaign other than the Devil's Brigade, which is somewhat skewed by the, uh, by the Americans, but that's another story unto itself. But the Italian campaign, it, because it occurred, the, the actual culmination, the liberation of, of Rome happened literally within 48 hours of of uh, the liberation of Rome uh, is never received uh, its, its, its due course. But uh, I, I think it's often, a, you know, there's a lot of arguments that could be said that if the uh, 
Italian campaign hadn't been fought, World War II could have had a different outcome because the Germans wouldn't have had to divert troops there. There wouldn't have been that that third front. Uh, they might have then gone on. The Germans might have gone on to beat Russia and then, of course, then fight back uh, the European invasion. So I, I think it's important to discuss it. Next slide, please, Steph. Here's the culprits, uh, the leaders, and I won't spend into them because uh, I really do not like talking about Bernard Montgomery or George Patton because for them it was all about the personal competition between the two of them. Well, throughout the entire Italian campaign, the Canadians had the hardest battles, w without a doubt. And we'll talk about that more as we go. Um, the Italians uh, weren't in the campaign very long anyways, because uh, as soon as we landed in, in uh, our men coming ashore, were met by the Italian soldiers who were trying to, trying to uh, surrender. And that happened again uh, throughout going up Italy. But uh, the German uh, commander in, uh, in mainland Italy, um, you'll hear about him as we go through. Next slide, please. Steph? Now, Operation Husky, and I think we should first take a look at the whole Italian campaign. Why There are seven reasons why we, we had the Italian campaign. Canadians had been trained in England for all, for two years, since 1930, actually longer, since 1939, and they didn't really have that much uh, combat, the men who were trained. We had other things going on, like the Battle of Hong Kong. Our, our naval forces were active, uh, bringing in supplies to England. Of course, our Air Force were active as well. Um, we, as a group, the Allies, we were successful in Africa, and that brings to number three. Because we were successful, our men are already there, supplies are already there. We are close. We're now in the Mediterranean, and we wanted it for we wanted to control the Mediterranean Sea for supply lines. So, five, we wanted to knock off Italy, um, get them out of the Axis, uh, so that uh, we could just concentrate on uh, on Germany and Europe. Uh, the uh, six, we wanted uh, Stalin had been after us for a number of years uh, now to uh, open up another front to relieve the pressure on the Russia campaign that Hitler was waging. And then uh, the final step, meaning having the three three fronts. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to have Steph go through these next slides of almost every, uh, every uh, 30 seconds. Um, we're just going through all the all the regiments that were in the Italian campaign because they were pretty well in it from the very very beginning. The first is, and I wanted to show how they're right from across Canada. I, I won't discuss the little things that are in there. I'd encourage you on your own to go uh, to some sources, look them up. Most of these also have their own museums in their hometown, so so you can go and visit them. And some of the exhibits are actually quite. Uh, the Carrigan Museums is wonderful. The one in the, the uh, one in London, Ontario, is wonderful. And of course. Uh, War Museum, but they all feature somehow in some form uh, specials. So we have the Seaforth Highlanders. You'll go through that, uh, Steph, every 30 seconds. I'm going to talk a bit about that so I don't have to do that. Our campaign actually started in uh, July 10th, 1943, when the 1st Canadian Infantry Division landed, uh, uh, landed in Sicily for the beginning of Operation Husky. For the seaborne uh, attack, it was the largest uh, fitting attack ever launched until until D-Day, and uh, we launched it uh, on uh, we launched it. We had 2,590 vessels, and um, we had uh, uh, thousands of troops. We had uh, 100, 100, and 181,000 troops uh, there. The, uh, the Italians were quickly over uh, overwhelmed, and um, they were quick to surrender as we came on Pacino, and we needed a strategic air force. I'm going to show you a little map in a moment. And at, by nightfall, most of our, on the first day, most of our objectives for that first day were were covered. Here's the the, uh, the Hasty Peas, and you can see is that these uh, those who are not in the pro province of Ontario, Hasty Peas are are actually a group quite close to us, uh, Prince Edward Island uh, County uh, here in Ontario, also included Peterborough in the area. Next slide, please, Steph. Uh, here's the Royal Edmonton, uh, the Royal Eddies. Um, and when they reached the mainland in the Battle of Ortona, they fought to the point where there was only 17 men left in the regiment. They were almost completely destroyed. While Steph keeps on going, I want to give you some interesting facts about Operation Husky that a lot of people don't know. If you think about the attack on D-Day, 
especially if you ever watch the movie uh, Private Ryan, you'll see one of the ways they get through the uh, shoreline defenses by using what's called um, Bangalore, Bangalore uh, uh, torpedoes, where they put connect all these types and uh, uh, pipes together and then fire uh, missiles uh, along the pipes to, to blow up. They use this to destroy the barbed wire on the beaches so they can get through it. The, the heaviest uh, challenges we had as we went up through Italy, because in the attack in Italy, we went up the middle. We went up through the mountainous side, the hilly side, while the British were on the uh, right-hand side along the coast and uh, and the United States were on the left-hand side. We were protecting the uh, the flank of the British and they were both both Americans and the uh, uh, and the and the British because of the flatter lands and the beaches were able to travel most of the time through armored vehicles. Well, we uh, the very few tanks we had were quickly bogged down, uh, and so we had mainly had to use uh, donkeys uh, to transport all our equipment and all our supplies, which made it really difficult. The challenges that we faced were the dust, the heat, the sunburn, malaria, and jaundice and dysentery, and, so, and we hardly had any medical supplies. Uh, we were desperate for them. Luckily, uh, as we fought through the uh, German defenses, we found a cache of German medical supplies. So we were able to use them. But the donkeys were our biggest thing. And uh, you'll see that uh, along the way, the uh, the German commanders couldn't believe how good we were. And they started referring to, they were telling their soldiers that uh, they were fighting uh, men who were especially trained from Canada, who were known as the mountain boys, uh, which of course was completely and totally false. Next. Next slide, please, Steph. This is uh, a, the uh, last slide showed how Farley Moad wrote his famous book uh, on the war. He got his start as he fought in the war. Next slide. Here's the our Quebec Regiment, the uh, the Loyal Twenty uh, Second, Carlton, York, uh, Toronto. And if you'll keep going, uh, slides as we go through. On the eleventh, uh, we were delayed, but not as much as uh, by enemy opposition, but by the thousands of Italian troops wanting to surrender because we couldn't. Uh, they get past them, had to take them prisoner and deal with them. We went on the inland route. Uh, we guarded, there was a British 8th Army's left flank, as I mentioned, and uh, we were to meet uh, eventually uh, just before outside the uh, the uh, Messina, which divides Sydney from the Italian mainland. Uh, Germany, as they set up to, to stop us, basically they started the campaign the same way as they did in mainland. Um, they set up um, heavy entrenched fortifications on higher land each time. And after we would overtake them, just before, as we were overtaking them and they were suffering heavier losses, they would uh, they would head up the mountain. They would retreat to the next one. So once one line was breached, they'd retreat to the next. On uh, July 18th, uh, next slide, please, Steph. You know, uh, West Nova Scotia Regiment, of course, was, was pivotal as well. On July 18th, we met our heaviest resistance to date at. Uh, uh, we were fighting before the town and on adjacent regions resulted in 145 casualties, including 40 killed. But the Germans, to show you their casualties, they lost 250 men, which we captured, and an estimated uh, 180, 240 killed. And here's where you can see the troops. Here's where uh, we went up the line and uh, and all the dates are, are there and just it'll show where the uh, uh, the Americans and the uh, British went up the other side. Um, it was at the uh, Field Marshal Kessling, who especially you saw, reported that his men were fighting heavily trained, and they called them the Mountain Boys. And so the beginning of our reputation in the uh, in, in Italy was beginning. It was for the next 17 days. Uh, we were very, very involved, went up the mountainside at uh, the second top one at Leon Fort, uh, the second infantry. Uh, Brigade spent a night of house to house fighting, our first time of urban combat. And then we had to revisit that when we get to Artona. And the ACPs, they carried out a nighttime raid. Uh, we had to climb the 904 meter high Monte Soro to surprise the German defenders from behind. By the first week in August, the Germans were caught on a closing vice because we joined the British and coming up on the side as we went into Messina. And then August 17th, the Germans evacuated uh, Sicily. And uh, by that point, we had marched by foot to uh, 110 kilometers and suffered 22,310 casualties, and uh, which, which 562 were killed. Next slide, please. 
I want you to try to remember the, the facts on here. The Sicily campaign lasted 38 days. Canadians, we had 1,000, uh, sorry, uh, 1,664 wounded, 562 killed, and 84 prisoners of war. And that was over um, 38 days. It's, we'll do a comparison there when we uh, get to War Tona. So we we're now successful here. We now started heading into uh, mainland. We landed in mainland. Next slide, please. It was during this time, just a little bit of a side story, that the, uh, the our men started becoming known as the D-Day Dodgers. It, it's sort of may or may not be true that Lady Astor, who was always going at it with uh, with uh, Churchill, referred to them publicly, oh, you, the D-Day Dodgers, because they were going to miss the D-Day. The men heard about it. They actually wrote uh, wrote their own song called "Where the D-Day Dodgers," and they would sing as they were marching. And they definitely sang it as they marched into, uh, into Rome and when, when they liberated. Next slide, please. During the uh, the, the Italian campaign, we actually won uh, three Victoria Crosses. Uh, Canada did, and uh, we'll cover. Uh, you saw one of them uh, um, in in one of the things. We got two more important ones coming up uh, as we go through the battle. One will be the liberation of Rome, and then, then we'll talk about uh, another one uh, we need to do to Ortona. Next slide, please. So once again, we uh, we had the uh, sort of the rough side. As you can see here, we went up the, uh, the side on the other coast, and well, the Americans went up right up the uh, western side all the way up to Rome. Um, we had to go through the mountainside, and uh, I guess the best way to understand that is if you if you have some classical history, some classical history background, uh, Italy was always known as uh, city states uh, because every town had its own government. Because and when you go into Italy, you'll see how all the towns as you drive through the countryside are up on mountainsides. The Germans, same thing as they did in Sicily, would fortify these high areas and then shoot down, and then the Canadians would have to work the way up and fight them. But perhaps one of the biggest, more structured ones is along the Moro River. And that's out up by the Adriatic Sea. And it was early in December that uh, we were we were given the job of tasking of crossing the Moro River. And uh, it was on December 6th that the, the princesses, uh, uh, Patricia's won uh, the Villa Rigatti on the left flank, but they had a retreat when the bridge support, you know, could not support the uh, the weight. And then finally on December 9th, we uh, reined it. But it was, but the whole assault here was uh, was on the gully. When you get to the Moro River, there's a famous Moro River cemetery that you'll visit, and I would highly recommend that if you're there, either by yourself or if you're taking a group, to please make the walk from the cemetery to downtown Ortona so you can follow the route of the soldiers and you can understand. But you have to understand that it was an absolute quagmire. The uh, we were the um, it, it's absolutely uh, horror, horrible, and the uh, there was, a, there was one of the big passes, it was nicknamed the Gilly. Next uh, slide, please. And here you can see one of the tanks trying to get up the side. Um, after retreating from it, the, uh, the Panzer Division set up a defensive line in the ravine outside known as the Gully. And that's what it was. And uh, if you walk to the Moral Cemetery, you go downhill, obviously, then you have to come up. And uh, when you walk it, I don't care what the weather is, just imagine in freezing cold and in the mud. On the on the twelfth, the uh, the German side actually they had because they're high casualties. They even had uh, their elite division, uh, parachute division, come in. Hitler, because of his experience personally in fighting World War One, at this point he sent his best troops that he had available to the uh, to fight in Ortona, and he gave them the order that they could not surrender, they could not vacate Ortona, that this was the point of no return. They had to stop it. Next slide, please. Here's another famous uh, battle that happened as well uh, in, in getting it. We kept trying uh, to uh, cross the gully uh, for on December 14th and the 15th. The Royal 22 Regiment out of Quebec was outflanked on the gully, but 81 of the men under the command of Captain Paul Triquette uh, from the 22nd Regiment, uh, his C Company, and seven Ontario tanks managed, uh, they tried to head to a high place called Casa Berardi, which you see in the picture there. Um, when they when they reached it, but uh, Trichet is 
supposedly shouted, man, the safest place for us is right here, so we're not leaving this point. And he managed to to uh, to uh, withstand all the counterattacks and hold on to that grant until finally they uh, received uh, support after four more days of fighting to uh, to gain that uh, crossroads so they could cross into our Twitter. And then from there, this battle, the uh, Germans retreated into the city of uh, Ortona, which the Germans were now preparing. Next slide, please. Here's Paul Perquette and uh, his order for the, uh, what a citation I read. He uh, had a long and storied Quebecer uh, in, in the war uh, and then on into uh, all further battles. Next slide. Ortona. So we finally captured uh, the gully on the 20th, and now we had to prepare. While we were trying to capture the gully, the, the Germans were preparing it. And what they were doing was to stop our tanks. They were now making it across. They uh, they blew up buildings. And they uh, filled the streets so the tanks couldn't, down, uh, couldn't come down the streets. And they started booby trapping everything. And they put their men in the, in the buildings, in the windows, so they could shoot them as they came down the street. Because of what happened, Ortona became known, and still is known today, uh, in military studies, as Little Stalingrad. Because what basically happened is, this is where urban warfare was invented. We uh, did a thing called, uh, next slide, please, uh, Steph. The, we did a thing called mouse holding. And the only way we could advance in the city square was by entering the first building, then going up to the top floor, blowing a hole in the top floor, and that building from top down, then going back up and blowing next door, mouse holding, convenient like a mouse would. The, the Battle of Ortona lasted eight days altogether. If you remember the numbers I told you before, in the eight days, we lost 2,300 were wounded, 650 were killed. Uh, it's probably the uh, the busiest, the deadliest eight days of combat we had in the entire World War II um, at, 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 at at one time. Next slide. So it was in the uh, in Ortona that the, on December twentieth that the uh, Royal Edmonton C Fourth Highlanders supported the tanks from the Three Rivers. Uh, they became embroiled and vicious. They had the hand to hand combat that I was talking about with the Germans First Parachute Division. And uh, so they had to blast away through the building. It was on, uh, there was no pause in the fighting right through Christmas. And uh, on Christmas Day, we stopped and uh, we had a famous, what's known as a, the Christmas dinner. And you can see it up there in the corner. If you visit the Ortona, you, uh, the building, the church uh, complex is still there. And it uh, can be, uh, it's now basically used as sort of a, uh, YMCA, YWCA for local teens. It's a, it's a drop-in center for them, and uh, they have some athletic programs taken on. The other thing about visiting the, the village of uh, Ortona in current day is the buildings still have bullet holes in them. Even though many have been repaired, you can still go up and put your fingers in the bullet holes in the bricks. It's quite remarkable. So it wasn't until uh, December 28th that the battle ended, and uh, the German uh, withdrew despite uh, Hitler's command. Overall, you, you saw the fights we lost, uh, depending on who you uh, figures you, you believe, from 2,600 to 2,800 lives, uh, casualties, uh, including all the dead. We also had about 4,000 had to leave Ortona or stay behind just because they were totally exhausted by the, uh, the entire battle and also the weather. Now, some interesting traditions have happened. There's a famous story of the Lazorda sisters in the city square. They have a, a memorial, they had a tank memorial uh, commemorating the, uh, the Royal Eddies, which they arranged to have the tank delivered to, uh, to, uh, to the town of Ortona or after the war. But now they've expanded it. I, I wasn't able to get a new shot at City Square. But part of the tradition happened because of the Maria and Francesca of Sorda. These are two Italian young ladies who, during the war, after they were liberated, came out from their small room. They started doing laundry and cooking meals for the Canadian soldiers who were still there. And uh, they lived there until they died. Um, they would, every day, daily, they would bring out, every day, maybe two of the longest, they would bring out fresh, fresh flowers 
uh, and, and lay them on the price of peace monument to take and the monument that was passed until they passed away. The last one died about, uh, I think it's uh, Francesca died about just about five years ago. But uh, the tradition lives on and the Italians remember. There's, a, there's an incredible museum that's uh, in town that you can join, tells the story of the Ortona, the Battle of Ortona. And they have this handmade model of the uh, town of Ortona and what happened to it. That model, if you go to uh, the city hall in Toronto, has been recreated in, in cast and brass. It is on there to commemorate the Battle of Ortona. Next slide, please. Resources. Um, now, the interesting thing in, in, in studying the entire Italian campaign to move past Ortona is that uh, in Canadian history books, you won't find much about it. So, you have to find some research, you have to go online, or there's some great books. Mark Zolke, uh, a famous uh, British author, uh, sorry, a uh, British Columbian uh, author, um, has written a number of books on the Italian campaign, and he's actually won the uh, Pierre Byrne History Prize for for a series. So I've got them listed there. And then, of course, there's a famous book in 1956 written by Colonel Nicholson. And there's a um, a, a book, uh, basically, it's told through uh, cart cartoonography, uh, cartoons of Canada War by Paul Carey that you can get through uh, DNM publishers. That has a really good video that you can watch. It tells a whole bunch of video. It's, you can get it through. Uh, through the Legion magazine website, and uh, it's about seven minutes long, which tells the entire story right to the liberation of uh, Italy. And then I highly recommend a video that's uh, that's coming up. It's based. Uh, it's going to be featuring Stanley Stanley Tucci, a famous uh, author you may recognize for numerous movies uh, called Search for Italy, and it's kind of more of a tourist uh, movie because it's really talking about eating his way through Italy. So it gives. Uh, you could use it with your students or for your friends just to show about how, uh, if you, as you travel through Italy, you'll see how there's different flavors. They all have their own specialties. And uh, even though you could be ordering basically the same thing, it can be kind of pasta, it'll taste different in the different regions of uh, Italy. So it's quite fascinating. And of course, I highly recommend the Veterans Affairs Canada website, which is on, uh, which is online, which we borrow a number of the uh, slide information from. But they're there. And I believe there's a teacher's guide for it too, I think. Uh, next slide. Now, if you're interested in going to Italy, uh, Explorica World Strides has a couple of campaigns which are, are really, really great. The great thing about the uh, researching and doing an Italian 80th anniversary tour is it doesn't really matter when you do it. Uh, if you're going to do the one with teachers on Ortona, you can do it in November. To celebrate the uh, Christmas dinner, and or you could do the uh, uh, liberation of Rome uh, in May uh, when it happened, and then go on uh, the D Day even if you wanted, or, or just stop there. But you could also do Rome and uh, and, and uh, Monte Cassino. That the two fascinating stories and the great trips. The other great thing about um, the Italian campaign is you're not going to run into veterans. Okay, I mean, quite honestly, there's, there's going to be uh, no big celebrations because, like I mentioned in the beginning, it's largely been somewhat ignored as an afterthought uh, by some. It gets outweighed by because at the same time, the same time as the uh, as the D Day celebrations. Also, uh, you won't find too much information uh, coming from the uh, Italian government. They don't like to talk too much about World War II, but you'll find great support, great. Uh, when people find out that you're from committee, when you're in Ortona or in, you're in the Monte Casino, they find out that you're from, from uh, Canada, they pay great attention to you. They're more than willing to do some special things for you, which uh, we can we can help you to make it a very, very special occasion. It's, it's really uh, very heartwarming to see how, how welcome they are, because I mentioned they don't touch the, this, the, the adults who are there who still remember, want their youth to remember the Italian campaign, but it's not really taught in their educational system either because of the, uh, their concern about the European connections now, the European market. Next slide. Hey, Steph, if you would like to introduce uh, Erin, she can take it from here. Sorry, I've gone awfully fast, folks, but there's so much to cover, I could get overwhelmed 
talking about any, any one specific thing, but Erin uh, talking about some of the exciting programs that she's done. Well, thank you, Dave. That was great. Um, we really appreciate it. I would like to introduce Erin Stokes. She is one of our group leaders and a teacher from the Ottawa region, and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about her personal connection with Ortona and her grandfather um, and how she brings that into the classroom and when she takes care of the seat. Great. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay. And the camera is working. Oh, there we go. How about now? Yes? Yeah, there you are. I can see you. Perfect. Okay. For some reason, it looks like I'm looking off to the distance, even though I'm looking straight ahead. My apologies on that. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Stokes, and uh, I'm a teacher with the Ottawa Catholic School Board. I have been um, leading student trips with Explorica since 2007. Um, my first experience in Ortona was actually with Dave in 2008, and I've been back a few subsequent times. And so I thought I would just take a few minutes tonight and talk to you guys about my own personal experience um, with commemoration, specifically regarding the Italian campaign um, and uh, specifically the town of Ortona. Um, I was one of those students and teenagers who's very similar to the ones that I teach, and I'm sure many of you um, have encountered. I knew absolutely nothing about Italy at all when uh, I first um, was introduced to Canadian history in World War II. I knew about Dieppe, I knew about the Blitz, and that was about it. I knew my grandmother had lived during the Blitz. Uh, she was a war bride in England. She's pictured here on the screen. Um, that's obviously their wedding day. Um, but I had no idea that my grandfather had fought in Italy. I mean, I knew my grandfather had been in World War II. I didn't really know what he did, and he never really spoke about it. And for some reason, my dad never really spoke about it either, maybe because my grandfather wasn't um, so forthcoming um, when I was younger, like many of the veterans about his experience. And so it was only later, um, when I was in university and after my grandfather passed away, that I found out the um, unbelievable contributions that he had made because he left, um, it's really quite sweet actually, he left like a, a, a coil notebook uh, with what he called a soldier's story, and it was his scribblings and his ideas, but on the front of it was a grocery list. So, like, I knew that he needed eggs and milk and cereal. Um, and it was just some ideas, and then, of course, my uncles were able to fill in the gaps, my dad was able to fill in the gaps, and I, I learned a lot of things about my grandfather. Um, like many veterans in the years prior to his death, when I was living abroad in Korea, he was um, talking to my family about the things that he had gone through. Um, I, I was ignorant of his experience, even to the fact that when I was getting these pictures for Stephanie, um, I was at my, my, I asked my dad to send me this picture, um, the one on the left of my grandfather, and I said, it's really weird. I don't remember grandpa having those marks on his face. And he said, oh no, that's from, um, he was hit in the face with, with debris, um, during an explosion. And so those are actually, um, like scabs and, and not marks on his face. Uh, my grandfather, of course, is from a town in Alberta, which I hear there's another resident of on this web chat tonight, so hi, Ron, um, called Pinoka, and um, actually, he's not from there. He settled there after World War II. Um, he is from just outside of Veteran, Alberta, actually, and he um, uh, joined up when he was 22 years old. My dad joined the Air Force when he was 17, and we lived all over the country, and so I didn't have a lot of exposure to my grandfather. Um, in my teenage years, I saw him a lot when I was younger, but again, so a lot of the stuff that I know is told through his own his own words in this book. Um, my grandfather enlisted because his father had died when he was young and he was the sole breadwinner for his mother and he learned that if he enlisted, um, that he would be able to uh, support his all his younger brothers and sisters. And he actually, the story is that he sat outside of the recruiting office for two straight days because they wouldn't agree to give his mother his um, his allowance. Um, to send it directly home, and so finally the recruiting officer um, allowed him to go. My grandfather uh, quickly joined the Calgary Tanks and um, was trained as a tank driver. He, if you look up on me, if you're interested in any of, of the Dieppe raid, um, there's actually something on the Calgary Tanks where it talks about one tank um, returning from Dieppe, and that was my grandfather's tank. As they were offloading onto the beach at Dieppe, uh, the tank in front of him was shelled and they couldn't get his tank onto the beach. So he was the only one that made it back from Dieppe um, in, in one complete um, 
tank and tank company or tank group. And um, in his little book, he says that um, it, it was actually worse for him because he could run, but he couldn't swim. And so the idea of being out on a boat with everybody shooting at him was far more terrifying. So that was his story of Dieppe. He came back and was quickly, uh, as you know, the Calgary, de Calgary tanks were deployed to Sicily uh, in July of 1943. And my grandfather was eventually wounded um, within hours after the end of Monte Cassino. Um, he was hit with shrapnel. They told him they'd cleared German artillery out of the area. He got out of the tank with a couple of, uh, I think it was his radio men, and um, they were hit with shrapnel um, quite badly. Um, and so he, he did. Uh, my, he did survive the war, and he lived until um, 1999. Um, he was declared missing in action, presumed dead after Dieppe because he decided to stop and drink his way back to uh, the base as opposed to returning immediately. So he has some interesting stories about some of the escapades he got up to in Italy. But what I found really interesting as I learned this was I had this passion and this desire to see this place for myself. And so in 2008, when Dave presented the opportunity to all of us to go to Ortona, I was in. I was all in. Uh, I brought, I think we brought 36 students with us. And it was probably the most profound experience I've, I've, I had had until, um, you know, up until that point. Um, I will just say an aside, I did go to the 100th anniversary of Vimy Ridge and found out I was standing in the same tunnel as my great grandfather had stood 100 and years and one day before. So that was also pretty cool. Um, but my grandfather, um, he, he fought his way up with the Calgary tanks. Um, and the only thing he ever said about Italy ever was that he was um, in, like in constant danger. He never had a day's break. And he said that um, his favorite pastime was trying to outrun the German tanks. This is what he wrote in his little book. Um, and that he was scared every single moment of every single day that he was in Italy up until the moment when he got hit. Um, and so it, it was really profound for me to then be walking through these places and to know that that was the experience that he had had. We started, of course, uh, I think we started in, in uh, Florence, made our way over to Artona. Uh, we did that walk that Dave was just talking about from Moro Cemetery up into the church. You know, you can still see the bullet holes in the town. And it, it was a really, really, really profound. And, and the experience stuck with me. And so after we left that, I mean, I, I remember I brought a picture of my grandfather. I left it on the, the memorial. And one of my students represented him and wore his name on his jacket because he, he chose to. Um, and it was like, a, it was a really wonderful experience. And it stayed with me. And so I kept going back to Vinny. We would go, you know, do the the Flanders tours and those kind of things, and it was it was lovely. It's always been lovely, but there was this huge draw with me to go back to Italy, and to do it again, and to do it without the emotion. I think I think I felt a lot of guilt that I didn't know all of this stuff. Here I am, a historian and a history teacher, and I was only learning about my own personal family um, connection. And so I decided to go back. And so in 2016, we planned another trip. This one was going to include Monte Cassino. So it was really important to me that I see that area. Um, and it, it turned out that of all the trips I've done, that one probably resonated the most, um, with both myself and the students. So Steph, I don't know if you have the pictures of the students from, and that the picture in the middle, by the way, is me in Florence on that very first trip in 2008. So this is our trip to uh, the Morrow River Cemetery in 2016. And I got to have that wonderful teacher moment where I had experienced something profound eight years earlier and got to watch my students have the exact same experience. The two girls that you're seeing sitting on the right hand side, so you can see them off, to, off in the distance in the top right and just sort of at the bottom right there. Um, they're at the grave of their great grandfather. So their father's grandfather, who they had heard about, of course, for their whole lives as being this uh, World War II hero who paid the ultimate sacrifice in Italy. And they got to have that profound moment of visiting his grave. Um, I remember, I mean, the, I remember them talking about it for a year. On this particular one, every single one of my students represented a soldier who had died, but we, uh, we went above and beyond in 2016. I think I had learned a lot at that point. In, in 2008, I was still really new to the traveling and I, I wasn't sure what to do. And so by 2016, I, I really kind of had a, a, an idea of how to do this. And um, we pulled the attestation papers of all of the soldiers and the, the students really had a connection. Several of them found family members 
that they were able to bring mementos and letters over from. Um, and we ended up having this beautiful afternoon. We were supposed to go, I don't even remember what we missed that day. We were supposed to go on a tour of something and we missed it because the kids wanted to stay at Mora River. Um, and we did. When we were there, I don't know if anybody's met Francesco. Now he retired, which is heartbreaking, but Francesco was the um, the caretaker of the cemetery in Mora River. And he kept everything that was left on the graves in this in this shack. And he brought us in to see it. And it was, you know, 50 years. So however many years he'd been doing it, it was a long time. He'd been a little boy when he started. Um, anything that was just about to be destroyed by the weather or whatever he brought in. So letters from people that were left on graves. And you could see the love that was there, um, the respect for the soldiers and for this resting place. And the students really felt that. And so when we left, um, and I mean, I, some of those students had come on other trips with me. They still claim that Ortona was the one that was really the most profound for them. Um, it was so profound, as a matter of fact, that one of my students tattooed the um, the um, um, the service number of her soldier on her foot when she got home. Not that I recommended that. Uh, I had to make that very clear to her mom. Um, but because she said that she wanted him to walk with her forever. So these kids made these unbelievable connections while they were there. Uh, it ended up at the end, which I didn't take a picture of for obvious reasons, but it ended up with the entire group circling these two girls. Um, and paying their respects and there was not a dry eye even across the three schools that were there um just having that really really profound moment and of course then my ultimate italy uh experience ended with getting to see casino hill getting to see exactly um where my grandfather was wounded um and getting to see exactly what the canadians went through um i think that these these experiences have made ortona very foremost in my teaching now uh i really think that um, it is such a shame that all of these men were forgotten for so many years. And Dave made reference to the forgotten campaign. And it really is something, you know, especially if you're teaching the grade 10, I, I'm in Ontario, the grade 10 history, you know, you're, you're getting to the end of the semester and you're still on the rise of Hitler and you're, you're rushing through all of this stuff. And so I've learned to sort of slow it down and make sure that I, you know, that I'm paying the proper amount of time to, to campaigns like Italy. Um, for their significance. Um, it is the number one when this COVID thing is over, that is the trip that uh, my travel partner and I um, are on next, which is the 2000 or 2023 uh, Italy. We'll be doing the Venice to Rome, I think. Um, we did that last time when we really loved it. Um, because again, I think it is, it is, I mean, obviously Vimy Ridge speaks for itself, right? That is, that is a trip that students will, will never forget. But Ortona holds a special place with all of them. Most of these students are still in touch with me. Some of this, uh, them send me letters a few years ago. I think it was 2018, one of our students was traveling Italy. She went back to Ortona. She found her soldier's grave and she sent us an email uh, to tell us you know, how important it was to her to still have that connection. And so um, I guess that's really all I have to say about, I, you know, there's, there's something really profound about having that personal experience for myself, but I, I was really pleased that how I was able to um, see that experience coming from students who don't have the family connection. And it's not necessary to know someone, I don't think, who's been there. Um, if you can um, facilitate the research and get the kids to have that, that connection and that moment. When we got back, the other thing I will say is that when we got back, I think it was probably three or four months, we were getting letters and emails to the school from people who had visited Morrow River Cemetery. Um, and had found our letters and then we're emailing the school and asking, um, you know, to have those, the, you know, those, those thank you messages from them as to, you know, how profound it was to read those letters um, and to have those forwarded on to the students. And so the students have been able to take that with them as well. Um, obviously, I mean, just talking about the, the cooking your way through Italy. I mean, Italy is always, always a, um, a great trip. You're, I, I don't think I've ever had a bad meal in Italy or ever seen a bad sight in Italy. I mean, like, it, you know, it's great. But when you add this extra personal element on it, it's a it's a truly profound um, experience. I don't know if you wanted me to touch on anything else, Steph, but I think I kind of covered what was on my list. Dave? Nope. Erin, that was great. Okay, I have thank to say, you. Like, I, I was with Erin um, in 2015 in the Netherlands, um, and I went to Grosbeck Cemetery with you and the students. Um, yeah. And 
there were students that were they wouldn't leave the grave of the soldier yeah. that they um had researched like they didn't want to leave they were crying there was adults who had nothing to do with their group um thanking everyone from the group um for you know the kids projects and and what they had done and it was it was really moving and really really touching so yeah, yeah I think uh, I think at Vimy Ridge, I think I told you this as well, but at Vimy Ridge, the bus driver kept saying more Kleenex because I had to keep going back. He had to open up the bottom of the bus and pull out the boxes of Kleenex because the kids, again, wouldn't they just make these connections and they're so powerful and, you know, it's it's their moment. Yeah. The uh, if I can add on to what uh, Aaron said and to what Steph said, I've, I've seen football heroes from high schools. Have to be literally carried away from the grave sites of the soldiers they've adopted. Um, the students, it's, it's interesting that to have this conversation because in the past three days, I discovered a, a recent PhD thesis written at uh, written at the York University by a young man who's received his doctorate, and he wrote it on the art of killing and remembrance. And he talks about uh, the history of remembrance and how it's developed. And oddly enough, uh, um, if, if you want to read it, uh, please let us know uh, through this site or contact somebody in its work, and I'll, I'll send you the email address of it. But it, it, it's, uh, it's like 95 pages long, this, uh, this thesis presentation. But he actually documents and he quantifies how remembrance has changed in Canada. And specifically, he does a, a, a good 20 pages on Artona. And he talks about how nobody ever used to talk about the Italian campaign, but since the uh, since the uh, the students from Canada started making a trip, how the tide is turning on the remembrance. And so I'm actually have a deep concern about uh, a lot of things because of the COVID. But but across Canada, with all the schools participating and taking their students to battlefield tours and and, and immersing the students in this history uh, with the with the local people. And being in, actually walking in the footsteps, you have. Um, I'm afraid that uh, the momentum may be lost. So I would really, really strongly recommend that if you are able to either take a community group or take a school group, and definitely go yourselves uh, on one of our tours because they really are life changing. And that's something he documents too that he he quantifies is how how remembrance uh, participation in, across Canada has uh, has increased. It's uh, it's a remarkable uh, presentation he does. When you first read it, you may think he's being a bit critical. But no, he's he's just trying to show, and he's he's calling into question, you know, of how did we let this happen, and we, and we must keep it going because it's a it's a way to engage our youth today. It's a, a very very important part as compared to uh, I can I'm old enough to remember when uh, there was no mention whatsoever hardly of Battle of Vimy Ridge. And how things have taken off, and across Canada, the <clears throat> excuse me, the differences between how history, Canadian history, is covered across Canada. I mean, there are only three provinces in Canada which make Canadian history uh, mandatory. So please uh, engage us if you would uh, like some follow-up information, or if you have some questions you want to answer, and uh, if if um, if Steph will go to the next uh, slide. Uh, we want to thank you for, for participating. We're really excited about our next presentation. We're going to take a break from Italy. We'll come back, back to that in April. On March 17th, we have a, a young uh, professor at the University of Western Ontario, and his name is uh, Kyle Falcon. And uh, he just, uh, in the past couple of years, has uh, finished his PhD. And it's basically on ghosts in the war, on how there are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, many documented cases of soldiers who had were visited on the battlefield sites by their uh, um, former members who were killed before them, or maybe even family members who visited them in a spiritual uh, sense and to help save their lives, and some actually famous Canadians that are involved. So please mark that on your calendar for March 17th and uh, during the March break, and uh, we'll contact and I'll turn it back to Steph to finish off. Yeah, we'll get in touch with everyone to let you know how you can attend the next webinar. Um, we're holding it during March break. I know in Ontario, normally we'd all be off going somewhere, but we can't this year. So we wanted to bring you a little bit of entertainment during the break. 
um, and St. Patrick's Day as well, um, which is, you know, well, I'll be at home for that too. So it'll be great if everyone can attend um, and see what Kyle has to say. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming. If anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And this webinar has been recorded. So if there's any part that you wanted to go back to and share with your class um, or share with uh, any other teachers that you know, um, it will be available on our website in the next few days. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us.